Hello, BookTube. It's Tuesday, and that means Tag Tuesday. And what better kind of a tag than a virgin debut tag? <laughs> we have a brand new BookTube channel. Joe Spivey has made a BookTube channel, and he's made his very first tag, and he's tagged me in it. So how could I not do it? It's the university tag. And I'll leave uh, all the questions down below, and I'll also leave a link to Joe Spivey's channel case we want to get him over 100 subscribers or perhaps over 200 subscribers. <laughs> uh, so question number one is etymologically, this is going to be fun, isn't it? <laughs> the word university is derived from the Latin universitas magistrorum et scholarium. Okay, whatever you say, buttercup. <laughs> Meaning a community of teachers and scholars. What was the last book you read written by two or more writers in coordination? I'm not 100% sure of its title, but it's about the Habsburgs. It's long, and it's quite readable. And in connection with this book, we are stretching in coordination so far, you can barely recognize it. <laughs> Early 2025, I'll be happy to revisit the subject. Uh, question number two. <laughs> in 1088, the University of Bologna saw the advent of the university as we recognize it today. What is your favorite slash most recent read novel set in Italy? I haven't read a novel set in Italy in quite some time. But I did read a couple of nonfiction works set in Italy, one of which was Pax by the noted Spider-Man scholar Tom Holland, uh, about the height of the Roman Empire, about uh, the rule of the Antonines, the rule of the Spanish emperors, a uh, key player in the bulk of the book is my own guy, the Roman Emperor Trajan. <laughs> That's set mostly in Italy, so that was that will have to do. I can't remember the last novel I read set in Italy. Maybe a romance of some kind. Uh, and prompt number three is a university study usually involves a significant change of residence or lifestyle. <laughs> yes, it does. Yes, it does. Both resident and lifestyle. Yes, you go to university, that means two things. One, uh, you're going to travel far from home, and two, you're going to start claiming you're the sex you're not. <laughs> uh, uh, what is your favorite book slash series focusing on an immediate change of residence? Well, for a project not connected with BookTube, I am currently rereading the Left Behind saga by by Timothy LaHaye, uh, which definitely counts as a change of residence series, although we don't learn much about the people who... who uh, decamp stage left <laughs> we don't we don't learn much about where they've gone we just learn about what's left when they go uh, it was a the left behind series was a publishing phenomenon for the better part of a decade sold millions and millions of copies was made into i think a tv show and also a movie uh it was a phenomenon it has come and gone but uh all phenomena are worth studying so i'm I'm lending a hand to a study of that, so that's on my mind. Certainly, I don't know about favorite, but certainly it is immensely enjoyable. Those books are just so immensely enjoyably horrible <laughs> that I, I haven't had a dull moment. Uh, then, uh, let's see here. Prompt number four is the 21st century university student is expected to fork out tens of thousands in order to breach a university's sun gilt fac faculties or facilities. And here, sun gilt is misspelled in what I'm sure is an Oedipal slip of some kind or other. Uh, name a book that costs you an exorbitant amount in exchange for little reward. And here, that cost me an exorbitant amount won't be the price of the book. Because aside from the Brattle sale lots for a dollar a piece, I don't like to pay for books. We went through this whole melodrama just a, a couple of weeks ago. When I even made a video, a self-serving video about how, you know, I want to be just like the ordinary folks. What do the common folk do when they want to buy a book? What do you all do? Do you go to Amazon? Do you go online and go to your favorite online book vending site? I want to know your stories because I'm in the trenches with you for a new translation of the Diaries of Franz Kafka. And I got a lot of great suggestions from a lot of you as to where you get your books. And... I thought, very self-righteously, I thought, well, I will implement the best of these. I will spend an hour to play around online and see which the best ones are. And at the end of that hour, I was terrified at the idea of spending money on a new book. So I just requested a copy from the publisher. So I don't, I'm not talking about money here. But a book can cost you a lot of other things than money. Books demand money, time, and attention. 
either all three of those or one or two of those, and those are all in extremely short supply. So I'm going to tell I'm going to say Shimmering Details, which is a new gigantic two-part memoir by Peter Nadas, who wrote a novel that I really really liked, but the Shimmering Memories was a just an endless slog. Just an endless slog. Now, I got the two advanced copies. Uh, they broke it up into two. I'm not sure if it was written in two parts. It doesn't read like it was. It'd be nice if it was one big 1,200-page book. Just get it over with. <laughs> Just rip the Band-Aid off. Uh, but I, I don't think it was written in two parts. But I read both parts in the advanced copy. Now, it, it, it's entirely possible that... I don't know, maybe that I got off on the wrong foot with the book or it was on the wrong register or whatever... So I will definitely read it again when I get the finished copies of those. Definitely. Especially since the author's credit in the Bank of Steve is really high. The idea that he could write... A, if you had told me that a 1,400-page book by this author is coming out, mail, memoir, nonfiction or nonfiction, whatever you told me that it was, I would have been eager to read it. So the credit in the Bank of Steve is making me think that maybe something went wrong with, you know the wavelengths, <laughs> when I was reading Shimmering Details. So I will go at it again, and we will see what we will see. But for now, uh, it cost me a lot in terms of time and attention and did not pay me back anything, just nothing at all. Uh, then the next prompt is universities and their attached student unions boast innumerable societies that gather zealous of everything from badminton to beard trimming to bardolatry. Yes, student unions. Yeah, the Oxford Student Union, for instance, which is a long and storied history of intellectual debate where they bring in speakers, great speakers, legendary figures, the figures from history whose names you would know, who went to the Oxford Union to give their speech and then go across the road to the pub and drink with the students. Yep, an unsullied record of intellectual guests. And then they invited Nick Jonas. Five foot tall, 20, 20 cigars a day, Nick Jonas from a pop band to go and give a speech, to put on a three-piece a three -piece suit and go and give a speech at the, at the student union. Uh, it's, I'm sure, on YouTube. It's just bragging from beginning to end. Uh, <laughs> it's, anyway, uh, uh, name your favorite book that crafts or envisions a new or alternate society. Uh, and here, Well, actually, let me give you... I should show you some pictures, right, instead of just my face. Uh, I, I've mentioned this before. I love this book. Lawrence Scott wrote a book called The Four-Dimensional Human, which is about living in a digital world, about living in a world in which this is, in which the digital side of life is no longer just a silly little hobby or an affectation, but it is an actual vital part of your life. This was written 10 years ago, I think, thereabouts. We now live in that world, and that's just going to get more pronounced. And the sum of the thinking that he does in this book on that subject is amazing. When he wrote this book, he was largely positing uh, a new or alternate society that had not happened yet. And large chunks of it have happened already, but it's the thinking that I value the book for. This is just really thought-provoking stuff. I my all of my first three or four suggestions, ideas to respond to this were all doom and gloomy. Which Living in a digital world is not necessarily doom and gloomy. It has positive sides to it. Of course, the natural answer to this question about what was it again? A new or alternate society is the one that we are rapidly heading into it. We're heading into it as fast as a man can run. And that is the future world that you're, that young people are going to be living in. Joe Spivey is going to grow up uh, in this world. In the extremely unlikely event that he procreates, his children will, will grow up in the, in the world that I'm talking about. A world that has only two seasons, hot and unlivable. A world that has tens of millions of climate refugees. A world that has superstorms that wipe out cities or rip apart ocean boulevards or whole neighborhoods. A world that has no drinkable water. And that water is suddenly a resource that is margin that is portioned out by the very wealthy. Just like every resource in the world is today. There's water, water everywhere in the old way of thinking, and so that hasn't happened, but it's going to. <laughs> it's absolutely going to, and Joe Spivey's going to live to see that world. I did not pick any of those. <laughs> I did not pick any of those. I picked four-dimensional human instead, uh, because it's not necessarily doom and gloomy. It's, it's kind of exciting. Uh, so let's see here. Uh, prompt number 
Six, what is your favorite novel set within the walls of a university campus? I think I have a picture of that, too. Yes, Ivor Sturton's debut novel, The Night Climbers. A very stereotypical opening about, you know, a young boy, cheek of tan, from the provinces who comes to a fancy college and is immediately swept off his feet by the romance of it all. And I mean romance with a capital, with a little lowercase r. He becomes infatuated with a group of rebellious students who climb the masonry and the gargoyles and the, the cornutations, all the, all the various spandrels and whatnot of the ornate buildings of the college. That Ivor Storton took from real life. There, there are societies that do that, even though it's manifestly dangerous. Um, the, the main character in the book falls in love, erotically and otherwise, with the male leader of that group and also with the male leader's sister. And I don't know if this author has written anything else. I I don't I haven't followed his career. If he's written anything more than this, I'd probably need to be reminded of what it is. I thought this was quite good. Uh, I I chose this over Brideshead Revisited because not all of Brideshead is, is is set at Oxford. Of course the one of the most famous parts is, but not all of it is. Pretty much all of this is set at the university and at least it's not dark academia or if it is it's it's the right kind of dark academia so i i highly recommend it i i looked high and low here for my copy but it must be long gone uh let's see here question number seven oh right question number seven <laughs> question number seven made me laugh uncontrollably when i read it i'm going to try to get through it here with a straight face universities are touted as bastions of free thought and uninhibited expression <laughs> okay. Uh, name a book you've read that is produced by someone with whom you fundamentally disagree on a subject, but you like because of the eloquence with which it is written. <laughs> so we don't have to dwell much on that opening statement. That opening statement has never been less true. Never. Never. <laughs> than it is now. Universities are absolute quagmires of lockstep doxology. And if you break ranks, if you deny that groupthink, the worst possible things in the world will happen to you. It's not that you'll have two fewer friends. Stand up. If you're in a, in a lecture, stand up, look all the way around the room and say, no one in this room is neurodivergent, no one in this room is allergic to gluten, and no one in this world and no one else in the world anywhere is non-binary. Watch what happens. The professor will tell you to get out of the room. Even before the students react, the professor will tell you to get out of the room. The professor will put a mark next to your name on the class assignment sheet and get you expelled from his class. The professor will then go to the provost of the college and get you expelled from the college. But those are the long-term. Those are the long-term results. The short-term results is that you will have only about a 50-50 chance of getting out of that lecture room unharmed. The students won't argue. They won't stand up and say, how dare you say that? They will simply launch themselves at you mindlessly. And they won't be prosecuted for it. You won't be able to get a lawyer, and the police won't take your case, and the university won't press charges. So they'll just launch themselves at you physically. 50% chance you don't get out of that room without needing hospital care. And less than a 20% chance that you get back to any place of safety. Your room, your dorm room, your apartment without also suffering damage. Less than 30% chance of that. Just by saying that one thing, just by standing up and saying those three things, if you just said those three things, your career in that class, your university career at any university, and your physical safety would all be in complete jeopardy. Um, uh, no, not one of those three things would last the afternoon. <laughs> so universities are, might be touted as bastards of free thought and uninhibited expression, but they are gulags of North Korean groupthink. <laughs> Absolutely. Apply to a school, uh, uh, especially a, a really well-endowed college or university, anywhere in the West, and at every step of the application process say that you are not going to give your pronouns. You're not going to say what they are or what they aren't. You're not going to discourse on whether or not you think it's valid to give pronouns. You're not going to do it at all. You're going to leave that part of the application blank. It'll be sent back to you. I'm sorry, we, we got the 30-page essay that you sent, and we got your, your uh, processing fee for reading your application, which is what, 200 pounds? Uh, but you didn't check this box. and we need, we need you to check this box. Or not only will you not be acceptable for consideration for admission to Oxford, but we'll report you to the police. It's a crime not to check that box. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> so universities might consider themselves, they might tout themselves as bastions of free thought, uh, but they are very much not. They are the last place on earth where you would go to see anything like that. <laughs> Just, if you don't believe me, test it for yourself. Stand up in a lecture hall and say, none of you are neurodivergent. <laughs> Watch what happens to the faces of the students that you thought until that moment were your friends. All they will want, their whole personality will drain from their face, and all they will want to do is hurt you physically. <laughs> so, uh, so the universities are now the home of groupthink. But that's, it's, isn't it nice to dream? <laughs> and in answer to the question, now that I'm off my soapbox, there is a book. I think I have a picture of it here. Yes. Robert Sapolsky, Determined, is his new book. Uh, he wrote a book called Behave that I really, really liked. I've recommended it a million times on this channel. His new book is called Determined, and it is, it, any of you who listen maybe to Sam Harris's podcast or Joe Rogan, for God help us, you shouldn't, but if you do, you'll know that in the bro science world, there is this, this really common idea to chew on that people don't have free will at all. And that it, you know that it's it's kind of ridiculous to talk about it that way. And when a guy with a beard says that, uh, Sam Harris, as far as I know, the only dude bro who doesn't have a beard uh, and says these things. But and, and Joe Rogan doesn't count because he doesn't have a thought in his pretty little head. <laughs> he might repeat these things, but he doesn't say them on his own. But guys with beards, whether it's Bob Sapolsky or Daniel Dennett or uh, whoever it is, I've noticed that it's a real fad in bro thinking circles. To say this, to say, you know, we don't have any free will. And then once they say that and you open your mouth because the natural response you want to make is, of course we do. <laughs> Not just we do and here's my 10 reasons for thinking of it, but little child looking at obvious things, of course we do. You open your mouth to say that, but they're already on. Because when a guy with a beard says we don't have any free will, you know that you are in for 25 uninterrupted minutes of, well, actually. Just tw they're just going to talk without breathing for 25 minutes before they even open a crack for you to say, I don't know that that... And then it's another 25 minutes. <laughs> I've noticed that. And I think I know where it comes from. I have a daring guess as to where it comes from. It, this is obvious nonsense, right? I mean, as with so many things, it, it's like, well, <laughs> not, to, not to revert to the previous question, but of course... Biological organisms, in, in most biological organisms, sex is binary. A creature is either male or female. In humans, sex is binary. You are either male or female. You are not, it is not a spectrum. You are not wavering all around. And a few medical, medical confused cases do not throw the whole bathwater out with the baby. They don't do that. that. Obviously, they don't do that. In, during the AIDS epidemic, there was a small percentage of infected people who were simply immune to the virus developing in their body. They simply were. They, they got it, but it didn't develop. It didn't harm them. It didn't kill them. They just lived with it, and it was no big deal. There was a tiny percentage of gay men who could say that during the AIDS epidemic. Does that mean that AIDS was not real? <laughs> no, it does not mean that. It's only in the demented 21st century that severe medical conditions like intersex can suddenly become flag-waving communities of people who are proud of their medical condition. Uh, so if you were, if you were, that, until the 21st century, that was a self-evident thing to say. You are male or you are female. And along the same lines and with the same elementary nature was that, of course, you have free will. Of course you do. That it is self-evident that you do. This is a long book that says you don't. And I have, I have developed a theory as to why guys with beards go on about this. So I think it's religious. I think it's them being religious. All of these people are proud atheists. All of them are, will go on and on about, you know, the, the magic man in the sky. All of them have been down at Christopher Hitchens rabbit hole on YouTube. All of them, without exception, have been. Even the ones who knew Hitchens in person, Sam Harris has done a Christopher Hitchens rabbit hole many, many times. I believe it's just religion. It's easy to talk atheist. Right? It's easy to say, well, you believe in a magic man in the sky, or you believe in fairies or goblins or whatnot. I, of course, don't believe in any such thing like that. It's much harder to root it out of you, especially if you were indoctrinated as a child. If you aren't, on some fundamental level, if you aren't willing 
to live in an uncaused, unintended, unthinking universe of physical beings that don't go anywhere when they die. If on some fundamental level you're unwilling to live in that universe, really live in it, you're willing to talk it, but you're not willing to be part of it, well, then you'll do crap like this. Or you'll talk about uh, explanatory gaps between the brain's physiology and the mind, the phenomenon of the mind. But there's, there, uh, these are real questions. We're not the first idea. Sam Harris will say that. He will, he will still say that. What's his name? Who's a neurochemist? will say, we don't have the first idea. We don't have any way to bridge the gap the explanatory gap between the brain's physiology and the mind. And although they will all deny it until they're blue in the face, what they're saying when they say that is, maybe there's something there. Huh? Maybe there's something there. Maybe it's a dude, bro. Guys with beards, elbow patch, stroking the chin version of a sky man. That I could maybe live with. As long as I'm not just an animal on the road. As long as I'm not that. Because surely I can't be that. <laughs> The same thing is true here. If, because what are you saying? If you're saying that you don't have free will at all, but you still do things, and you choose to do some things and not others, you can argue, and Bob Sapolsky does throughout this whole book, you can argue all kinds of determinative factors, but what you are saying is if you don't have free will, someone else is doing this for you. Someone else is pulling the strings. Something else, or whatever. This is religious. The impulse, I think that when you get a, a guy with a beard and an ostentatious mug making an argument against something that is childly self-evident, I think ultimately the impulse is religious. In any case, whether it's, whether it's the so-called debate on free will or anything else. I mean, what is, not to keep reverting to this, this whole non-binary nonsense, but what is that? What is this? The whole gender identity thing is people saying over and over again, like it was just a matter of course, like it was something you shouldn't even question. People saying it was someone so was born in the wrong body. That you have, you have a, a, a male brain in a female body. Well, that's not true. That you don't have. There's no such thing as a male and a female brain. But they don't say that. Usually, these these uh, gender identity ideologues will say it's not a question of physiology. It's just your essence, yourself, is female in a male body. Well, that's a soul. What you're, what you're talking about is a soul. You are in your body. You are your body. <laughs> you, the only way that, you, that that works, that you were assigned the wrong body, is if there's a part of you that's not physical. There's no part of you that's not physical. If you believe that there is, you're talking about a soul. So I think, I think a lot of this, when it boils down to it, there's no state, state church anymore. Organized religion is under decline all over the world in massive numbers. I think when you don't have that and you have people that were raised in that, they will start to grope around for religions that they can embrace. I don't know. I, I, I really like Robert Sapolsky as a writer, as a thinker. This book is nonsense. It is, it is torturing an obviously nonsensical point. Obviously you have free will. Obviously you do. So when I see stuff like that, when I see someone with a brain torturing a childlike obvious point, I have to believe there's something else going on. And usually I'm finding that it's religion. If you get a, well, actually, guy with a beard who says there's an explanatory gap between the brain's physiology and the mind, the phenomenon of the mind, what they are talking about is the soul. <laughs> that is religious. There's no such thing as a soul. And if you're going to say, how do you know that, or you can't prove that, you're the one making the claim. If you're claiming that you have an immortal ditto copy of yourself living and lurking around inside you, prove it to me. I come up with 10 or 11 experiments that would prove that or disprove it. You would fail them all. Obviously, no one has ever proven this because it's obviously not true. You are a raccoon, a squirrel, that you drive by on the highway, you see them burst open, their guts in the sun. That's you. That's you. And you don't want... If, if you say, well, I'm, of course, an atheist, of course, I don't believe any of this, but you don't feel that, can't live with that. No, that won't be me. No, I don't believe in your sky fairy, but that can't be me. You're going to find yourself going to things like uh, misassigned at birth or the explanatory gap or that you're just a puppet of deterministic factors, whatever. Anyway, long digression here. Let's. That's a, a perfect example. This is an author I really like, and this book is pure nonsense. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> that went a little bit long. Let's go on. Uh, number eight. 
Universities pride themselves on cherishing outpourings from previously silenced or oppressed minorities. <laughs> no, no, they don't. They pride themselves on using those things as purse puppies, as, they, as little displays, as shields. Uh, they don't believe any of it. Uh, name a favorite book written by someone from an underrepresented group. Well, this week, of course, I am thinking about a writer I dearly love. Uh, this is Elon Poppy, and this is his uh, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. He is uh, a Jewish historian who hates the pernicious effect of the very idea of Israel. And nowadays, uh, <laughs> nowadays uh, is a proponent of the so-called one-state solution. Uh, he's been on my mind. I don't know if he's been on television lately this week. I'm sure that he has plenty of ideas about the news coming out of the Middle East, but, uh, but, uh, he's, he's a Jewish historian who is perfectly willing to tout all the evils of the Jewish state. I consider those to be a little bit underrepresented. Uh, and then number nine, university study can be riddled with dense, impenetrable scholarly tomes. What is your favorite piece of interpretive nonfiction written by an academic? Well, I have one in mind. Uh, it's this. It's, oh God, help us. Here, <laughs> you couldn't even see that cover. So let's, here, let's fix things. We'll go into the settings. Uh, we'll go to brightness. We'll lower it all the way. <laughs> we'll go back to books. Uh, while I beguile you with snappy patter, we'll go back to books and we'll see if that fixed things. Yes, it did. The Classical World. By Nigel Spivey, who I believe is Joe Spivey's gay homosexual common law husband. Ain't they? Ain't they? Uh, there's a bit of a uh, uh, May December age gap, but I hope we won't discriminate. Book two, will we? I'm sure we wish them all the best. <laughs> Nigel Spivey is a gentle, very eloquent classical scholar. The, the classical world is a wonderful book. It's by turns academic in that it's giving you a sort of a trot, rot, run through the classical world and its heritage in the modern day or in the medieval time. it Part of it is that, and part of it is also reflections on that world done wonderfully. Just done with a, a wonderful sort of laid-back eloquence. Really a book to enjoy. Uh, so hats off uh, to Joe Spivey's choice of husband. <laughs> so anyway, that is uh, the university tag with a huge digression in the middle there, just because... Sapolsky's book drives me nuts. It drives me nuts. I, I can I can hear the dude bros in the in the audience in the comments field. I can hear the dude bros gearing up for their well. Actually, well, the point he's trying to make here is well, the point I'm trying to make here. It doesn't matter. You obviously have free will. There is there are all. I'm not denying that there are all kinds of word games that can be built around anything, any subject. There are all kinds of word games that you can build. I'm not denying that at all. That doesn't change the obvious fact. And it's it's just a game. That's all at that point. Uh, anyway, <laughs> anyway uh, all I have to do is for me to tag people on Tag Tuesday. I want to tag uh, Randy Ray, the literate Texan, uh, Book Time with Elvis, and uh, also uh, Micah Cummins. If he's out there, if he's watching, if he does tags, if he ever makes a video again, I'd love to hear his thoughts. He's read a lot of university press books. I'm sure he has a lot of thoughts on subjects, but... Anyway, I want to thank Joe Spivey for tagging me in his very first tag. What an honor. Uh, so I'll leave a link to his channel. Feel free to go and subscribe. He makes two or three videos a week, it looks like. Uh, he could probably use the attention. <laughs> so I'll wrap this up for now, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.